Hi folks, Dr. Rob Cyrus. I'm the Carb Addiction Doc. And today I'm going to specifically help you to understand why snacking, snacking is always bad. Snacking is always bad if you're trying to be metabolically healthy. So first and foremost, I've got a little statement that I put out there. A snack is always, always, always an emotional event. It is never a nutritional event. So the, the reason we snack is not because of some nutritional deficit. The reason we snack is always, like a cigarette, something we do for emotional relief. And a lot of people say, well, I'm snacking on pork rinds, or I'm snacking on cheese, or I'm snacking on pepperoni. Yeah, those are, by what you're eating, by constituency, those are absolutely fine. No harm to that. They're part of the carnivore diet. They don't contain carbohydrates. Biologically and nutritionally, or at least nutritionally, the, the substrates, the consistency is not harmful. But I'm going to explain to you why snacking is a problem. First of all, just simply put, if you're trying to lose weight, um, and I know that in our space we don't use the word calories very often, I don't like that, but a snack is a caloric load, primarily for your head, that adds calories to your body that your body has to deal with. And if you're trying to lose weight, you're not using your own fat as that caloric source. But there's something more deeply in, in, uh, important about snacking and it's important to understand the concept of what we're trying to do with metabolic health. Not only are we trying to not eat carbohydrates and not eat uh, um, certain things, but there's a, a very, very important restoration of optimal health that is screwed up by snacking. So we'll come back to the concept of snacks and how to alter that and still get the emotional relief without the harm. However, there's a very important concept hormonally and metabolically that you want to understand. When human beings eat, and this is where my friend Jason Fung has done some tremendous work with intermittent fasting, there are three phases that the body cycles through each day when we eat. So this is a daily cycle, and restoring this daily cycle is one of the healthiest things you can do, independent and irrespective of eating carbohydrates. Guys, when I'm just dragging, when I'm struggling, when I've got a bit of brain fog, when I'm feeling a bit down, or when my blood sugar is a little bit elevated because of adrenaline, uh, because I've exercised and it's not coming down adequately, that is pro-inflammatory. And you know I love my coffee. You know I like my coffee with my caffeine. But there are times when I want a combination of an anti-inflammatory I want a combination of some caffeine for that stimulant effect, for that mind-cleansing moment that I use throughout the day, and I want to flip myself into deeper ketosis. Well, folks, the guys at HVMN, the Ketone IQ guys, have come up with an incredible product. So think about if ever you use a five-hour energy, or if, if you don't like coffee, if you're afraid of coffee, um, if you are relig have a religious objection to coffee but not to caffeine, Ketone IQ has come out with a caffeine-enriched ketone product. So not only are you getting the ketone bump to help you, if you use this in the morning, if you use this when you're dragging, obviously not before bedtime, this stimulant, the value of Ketone IQ with some caffeine in it, is no different than having a cup of coffee, except you're also getting the benefit of ketones. So for those of you adding MCT oil, adding butter for that same effect to your coffee, the bullet coffee, this is basically bullet coffee, except it's directly giving you ketones. Try it and see. Now everybody's going to give me pushback. Whoa, 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 whoa. If you're drinking coffee, if you're doing MCT oil, if you're doing butter, you're doing exactly this. Hmm. So the first thing to understand is when you eat, doesn't matter what you eat, you switch on a set of hormones that are called your storage hormones. They are triggered by the activation of certain hormones in your gut, GLP-1, peptide YY, cholecystokinin, uh, bile, a, a variety of hormones that get triggered in the gut. But primarily we're looking at three horm four hormones in your, inside of your body. And the four hormones that rise when you are tasked with metabolizing and storing food you've just consumed. Insulin, T3, 
free T3 thyroid hormone, testosterone, whether you're male or female, and human growth hormone. And we can easily measure three of those four. Human growth hormone, a little bit more difficult to measure, but we can measure spikes in the other three. And so what your body does is it releases, let's just use the word insulin to describe all four, releases insulin. And what insulin does is it also, when you're healthy, reduces glucagon. Glucagon is the opposite hormone. We'll talk about glucagon in a little bit. But as your insulin rises, insulin has multiple functions. Number one, it gets the liver to take up sugar and turn sugar into glycogen and store sugar in the liver as glycogen. And the liver is a very, very important repository for sugar as glycogen in the human body. Insulin then causes amino acids to be converted to human protein. You don't absorb protein. So all these people uh, uh, um, taking collagen, <laughs> come on, man. Collagen is just amino acids. Don't waste your money. But the liver reforms that, reforms certain proteins and ships those out as substrates, substrates to cells in the, in the form of globulin, albumin, and protein, but also as specific proteins, hormones, under the influence of insulin. Insulin also blocks the release of fat from fat cells, and actually, if you do eat fat, gets your fat cells to take fat up and store it. Fat goes up the lymphatic system into the bloodstream. Under the influence of insulin, you take up fat, so you're absorbing fat. And under the influence of thyroid hormone and insulin, the um, HMG-CoA reductase system is switched on. You stop producing ketones, it shuts that system down, and the, the same system is shifted across to produce cholesterol. So you're actively producing cholesterol. And you will be releasing some sugar from the liver that bypasses, and then insulin is there to get the body's cells to take up not only sugar, but the other substrates that are part of the storage. So you're going to storage mode, and all of the cells that are capable of storing um, energy and storing molecules for utilization, that is done under the influence of insulin. And then as you've distributed and gotten rid of what you stored, now your insulin numbers, those four hormones, start to go down. And your cells, instead of being net recipients of food for storage, they now switch to a point where they've used up the energy that they've stored, and they now go into demand phase, where your cells now need energy. So they require energy, they need energy, they've run out of their stores. And as those cells switch into demand phase, which can happen anywhere from 2 to 24 hours after you've eaten, depending on how much and what you've eaten, but usually 2 to 4 hours, you go into the first demand phase. And the hormone that gets triggered as part of your demand system is glucagon. There are a few others, but glucagon is the dominant one. And insulin levels are falling and glucagon levels are rising. And as that happens, glucagon's first role is to release sugar from the, from the liver. And the sugar goes into your bloodstream. And under the influence of insulin, your cells can now take up glucose. It requires insulin. You have to be insulin sensitive. But glucagon releases it and insulin absorbs it. So you've got that dual function of the two as they're crossing over. And eventually... Your, uh, the sugar from your liver is being used up, liver is depleted, now your insulin levels ideally are low, you still haven't eaten, and your glucagon levels are high. Well, what does high levels of glucagon in the, in, with low insulin do? Glucagon influences the release of fat from your fat cells. So your LDL numbers go up, you're releasing fat, cholesterol, vitamin D, all those good things, three omega fatty acids from your fat cells, back to the cells, back to the liver. And those fatty acids can enter the cells without the use of insulin, so you, your insulin levels are low, but also in, with low insulin and low T3, you switch off HMG reductase, you switch off cholesterol uh, production, and now the same system flips across, and under the influence of glucagon, you start to produce ketones. So you go from the glucose utilization phase into the fat utilization phase. And... When your insulin levels drop down, they have effects on every cell. So cell division is affected, which is the anti-cancer. So uh, you stop dividing those cells and you don't have cancer. You're repairing cells under the influence of glucagon. Autophagy is happening. Cells are dying. So you are restoring your metabolic health in the fat utilization phase 
but you are blocking cancer, you're blocking some of the harmful processes that occur with perpetually elevated insulin levels. You also are becoming insulin sensitive. You're recruiting insulin receptors. You're increasing the availability and the demand and the ease with which sugar enters the bloodstream. And glucagon under the influence of uh, causes gluconeogenesis, so you're also producing some sugar from protein. So all of those good things happen, those three phases. Uh, storage hormone, they tailor down glucose utilization, and then longer-term fat utilization. And ideally, humans should be eating once, maybe twice a day, where in a tidal fashion, you go through these. Now, let's go to snacking. So if your body's used to eating twice a day, and you're used to that hormonal uh, uh, pattern, which is incredibly safe, and healthy for your body. It's the most metabolically healthy you can be. Now you snack. And it doesn't what you, what, matter what you snack on. A snack, by definition, is the consumption of calories outside of a planned meal event. And whether you're eating pepperoni and cheese or M&Ms and Coke, it doesn't matter. While you're in some form of glucon, glucagon utilization, where glucagon should be rising and insulin falling, now you suddenly trigger the storage hormone system. And you develop hormonal chaos. Because your glucagon is trying to do one thing, and now you're triggering insulin, and the two conflict with each other. Now you've got high levels of glucagon, high levels of insulin, the paradoxic release of sugar into the bloodstream. Insulin can't clear it. You've got insulin resistance. And snacking is... An incredibly, incredibly disruptive, disruptive uh, hormonal process because it creates hormonal chaos in the human body. And it is a very big driver of metabolic disease, diabetes and other health issues plus weight gain. So understand that even a small snack, a tiny snack that you may think is healthy outside of a meal causes massive hormonal chaos and disrupts what you're trying to do, which is to become metabolically healthy. So try not to snack on anything with calories, even if it's pork rinds or something with fat. Now, let's flip that over. The problem with a snack, as I said earlier on, is a snack is always an emotional event. And you need about every 20 or 30 minutes, your brain needs some relief. But instead of having a cigarette, put gum in your pocket. And instead of having a snack, create a relationship with A bridge drink. This is Rebos tea. It's not my usual coffee. It's tea. Has no calories in it. Has no caffeine in it. So no triggering of adrenaline. No triggering of cortisol. Well, that's a different video. But this, for example, is a bridge. It gives me exactly the relief I want from a snack. A little mind cleansing moment so that I can refocus on the video. I call it a bridge. It bridges me across the need for something without causing harm. And it does not disrupt the hormonal flux because it's non-caloric. So if you use, if you develop a relationship with a bridge, and as you can see, somebody gave this to me. I've got my little sexy personalized mug. It's very close to me. But a bridge drink is a very, very valuable way to augment the response. Now, folks, the other thing that you can do is you can use an exogenous ketone especially as you're in recovery. And this is something called Ketone IQ HVMN. And the Ketone IQ is also a way, yes, it's got a few calories in it. However, it is pure ketones. So it helps with the glucagon system. It doesn't trigger the storage hormones. And exogenous ketones are one of the few ways you can preserve utilization phase not trigger storage phase, and yet bump your ketones, accelerate the transition from storage phase to fat utilization phase and leap over the glycogen utilization or the glucose utilization phase. So the Ketone IQ product, which we find does it, any of the exogenous ketones, but Ketone IQ in particular, we've experimented with a variety of them. It's the one that helps you to bounce from storage phase into into uh, um, the fat utilization phase under the influence of glucagon. If you have to have a snack, that's not a bad way to go to give you that extra ketogenic bump. But beyond that, 
even if you're eating fat, it still triggers insulin because insulin is your storage hormone. Not hugely, not hugely, not to the point that it's going to clear blood sugar, but you still get a triggering of your storage hormones. And we can measure that. I hope this has made you think. I hope this has made you understand physiology. Trade in snacks for bridge drinks and both psychologically as well as metabolically, you're going to be healthier. I am the Carb Addiction Doc. Hit the like button. If you disagree with what I'm saying, leave some comments, but subscribe to this channel. It helps us to keep the content free and flowing. And if you want to consult, if you want to know where you are, because we can measure which phase you're in, we can measure which phase, you, phase you're in, 561-517-0642, anywhere in the world, WhatsApp, text, phone call, leave a message, we'll set up a visit.